Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is first sight theory, how we all use extrasensory perception every day of our lives. My guest is Jim Carpenter, a licensed clinical psychologist. He has published over a hundred research articles, book chapters, and popular articles on parapsychology. He is past president of the board of the Rhine Research Center in Durham, North Carolina, and has served on the board of directors of the Parapsychological Association. As you might imagine, he is the author of First Sight Theory and also author of the book, First Sight, ESP and Parapsychology in Everyday Life. Jim is based in North Carolina, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Jim. I'm very happy to be with you today. Very nice to be here, Jeff. As far as I know, you are one of the old, I don't want to say oldest necessarily, but you've been in the field of parapsychology longer, I think, than, than any other living parapsychologist of, of which I'm aware. Maybe there are one or two exceptions, but I know your interest goes way, way back. You were reading J.B. Rhine's work when you were a high school student. I was. I was. And, had a little bit of correspondence with him in high school and came to Duke with his, if not encouragement, at least permission, um, and been involved with that field ever since. Now, if I remember rightly, he left Duke University in 1964. Uh, so you were, you were there before then. Yes, actually, I graduated in 63. Um, and then kept coming back summers. I was in one of a little group of people that he sponsored to come back for summer study while we were in graduate school, along with Rex Stanford and Chuck Onerden and um, Bob Morris. Uh, that, those were the main my main colleagues at that point. Well, and they all made great contributions to the literature, as have have you. Uh, I miss them all. They're they're all deceased now. I know, I know. I miss them too. But but you're really part of of that generation of people who I guess it'd be fair to say were the original students of J. B. Rhine. Yes, yes, I certainly was. And uh, at the same time, as as you were getting trained and doing research in parapsychology, you you developed a professional practice in, in a I think of as a related field of clinical psychology. Indeed, yeah, I went to graduate school in clinical psychology and got the PhD, and and um, went on and had an academic career in clinical psychology for a while at the University of North Carolina and then left that and went full-time into private practice. But all along, I've kept up um, an involvement in, um, in parapsychology. I came back, to, my wife and I came back to um, the Durham area uh, for me to teach at UNC after graduate school, partly because it was, gave me the chance to continue an involvement with the lab along with my uh, mainstream psychology profession. And, and I know it must have felt a little bit schizophrenic because for the most part, mainstream psychology is, uh, they're not even neutral about parapsychology. They tend to be antagonistic, more so than, let's say, physics. Oh, yes, that's for sure. And um, I remember someone said at one point that hostility to parapsychology um, varies uh, inversely to the distance 
or varies as a function of the distance from Durham. And so coming back to Chapel Hill was right in the center of the area where there's still a lot of suspicion and hostility. And yeah, it's, it was a rough ride in that way in a lot of ways, actually. I, I, um, I had a lot of, got a lot of flack for maintaining that interest. So you've managed to develop a career that balanced these two interests. I mean, clinical psychology is so closely related to parapsychology because both fields are ultimately looking at the the nature of the human mind itself. Yeah, a, a, a common link that for me is that both of them, uh, the the patient in therapy and the the person in a in a parapsychological experiment, are both trying to discover a new meaning. They're both trying to create something that in some ways shouldn't be creatable. The person in therapy is trying to, in some ways, become a new person. The person in a parapsychology experiment is trying to do something Im impossible because you're asking them to. And... Um, and, of course, Freud and all the way back, a lot of therapists have talked about parapsychological observations in therapy, and I've kept track of that myself, and that's been a rich journey, too, because uh, I've had a number of patients bring in lots of interesting psychic experiences, sometimes right part of the therapy itself. Is it fair to say, I believe, that your own personal interest in parapsychology began in childhood as, as a result of experiences that you had? Well, yes, I think especially I became curious about it because my mother had experiences that were uh, anomalous and <clears throat> she would tend to, she had dreams that came true, she had visions that predicted the future in remarkable ways. Um, she tended to know who was calling on the telephone. Um, and so the family sort of took that for granted. And uh, she was also a librarian for a number of years in our little town in northern New Mexico. And um, so she would bring home all the J.B. Ryan books, which I ate up, and uh, along with some of the books from uh, Britain that in that field. So, yeah, I started reading that in, in high school and became fascinated with it. I also have to think that the theoretical work that you've done, uh, to some degree, builds on the work of Gertrude Schmeidler, who uh, was very insistent that ESP could be understood as a normal psychological function. Absolutely. I, I tr go to some trouble to shout out Gertrude in that respect. She made a wonderful contribution in that way. She, her, her theory of parapsychology was that psi is a psychological function. And um, that's the, the motto I followed in my own attempt to develop a theory. So yeah, I'm very much in Gertrude's footsteps along with some others, Rick Stanford and um, those are the probably two main ones. And I think it would be correct if I were to try and sum up the first sight theory that you've developed in, in a nutshell. It uh, would be that we are all at a subconscious level using ESP all the time. It's the very foundation of our normal consciousness. Yeah, that's the assertion I want to make. Uh, that's why it's called first sight theory. And it's modeled after research in subliminal perception, which I, I puzzled over for years following that literature. And because the obvious connections to parapsychology uh, uh, kind of shout out to you if you pay attention. Um, and what, what we see in the subliminal perception literature, and psychology's come along only very gradually and reluctantly to this understanding, but it's pretty well established at this point, that every experience we have has an unconscious history, that there are pre-conscious processes that produce all of our experience and all of our behavior. 
and that's understood often just at a kind of impersonal biological level. Those are brain events that are somehow causing consciousness. And that's true as far as it goes, but it's not actually an impersonal process there because the whole thing is guided by personal intentions. So two people can be sitting in the same room in the same stimuli and they're going to, their pre-conscious processes are going to produce very, very different streams of, of experience because they have different histories and different intentions in the, in the setting. And so it's a, it, I make the assertion that every bit of experience, every bit of behavior is preceded by pre-conscious processes. And these pre-conscious processes include, always make reference to information beyond the sensory sphere. That we're, we're privy to all of that. Um, I use Whitehead's term prehension, that the unconscious mind prehends reality far beyond the boundaries of the senses and um, makes use of that in every bit of experience that we that we construct unconsciously and so um, yeah ESP is ESP and PK are consulted in every act of behavior and experience and um, but it's all invisible. And the theory also, I try to talk about um, how we so rarely have what seem like psi experiences. Why is the, if this is actually going on all the time unconsciously, why aren't we aware of everything all the time? And um, for the same reason we're not aware of all of the sub subliminal stimuli all the time. For one thing, they're not experiences. They're, they're pre-conscious and they're unconscious. So by their nature, they're not available to experience. But what we can see in the certain situations is we can see the inadvertent expressions of these things. That's how we know that a subliminal perception has occurred. We never see it. Um, but we can, if we set the experiment up correctly, we can see the effects of having been exposed to a subliminal perception. And that's exactly what we do in a parapsychology study. We look at things that imply the target or imply the information. This is true in remote viewing or Gonsfeld or any parapsychological situation you, you want to discuss. Um, the, and one implication of this, I'll just, I, I do like your questions and I want to be guided by them, but I'll just say that um, one implication of this is that we, in the past, since we have thought of Psy as a rare ability, that a, maybe a few people have and they maybe have it for a little while or they have it at certain rare moments, if we think of it as something that's actually going on all the time out of sight, the whole function of an experiment changes. Um, the rare ability idea, the function of an experiment is to kind of set a trap and catch this rare beast in our, in our study. From the first sight point of view, we're not trying to catch something that's rare we're trying to reveal the functioning of something that's going on all the time. And so first sight experiments tend to have different qual they tend to ask different kinds of questions than uh, experiments from other points of view. And they um, tend to look at different expressions of psi than, than a lot of other experiments do. There's so many questions I want to ask, but to begin with, you mentioned psychokinesis, and I, I want to pick up on that because I had always assumed, and apparently incorrectly, that first sight was 
a theory about extrasensory perception and, and that psychokinesis was really not part of the theory. So, uh, perhaps you could explain a little bit how that would fit in. Well, I do try to make it part of the theory. Um, I, I, I focus on ESP in, in my book because um, there's much more psychological research about ESP. Uh, most of the PK research has not been done by psychologists. It's been done by physicists, engineers, people who are interested in different kinds of questions. And, um, and so there's not that much psychological literature. And what I was trying to do in the book was spell out the theory and also um, hold it up against normal psychological findings in a number of different areas of mainstream research. Um, so I was focusing on where the psychology work is. But yeah, in the theory, um, PK is considered first act. In fact, the, the, the basic function of ESP, why do we have ESP, what's it for, is um, to help us form the next best possible experience in this situation that I'm in at the moment. The function of PK is to begin the optimal response to the situation that I'm in. And the basic function of PK, as I propose, is the link between my intention and my body. And so when I say to myself in the morning, it's time to get up, and I get up, what connects my intention to my musculature by way of my brain is PK. So the ordinary function of PK is to link intention and action in my own body. Now sometimes PK also exists outside the body, just like most experience is formed out of immediate sensations. But sometimes it's important to use information that comes from somewhere beyond immediate sensations. And then we see evidence of ESP. And there are also times, in PK is ordinarily restricted to my body and my sensations. But there are also times when my action needs to actually happen out in the world beyond my body. And then we see these remarkable instances where in fact, something in the world responds to my intention. Um, and they're, so they're, they're, they're linked process. They're, they're, they, they work right together with each other, it seems to me. I seem to recall J.B. Ryan uh, raised that very point, that we use psychokinesis if I want to raise my hand like that uh, as, as an act of will. Uh, of course, experimentally, that doesn't work too well because people will say it's, it's somehow normal. It's not paranormal. Well, most of the expression of ESP and PK is normal, and they never, we never see it as anomalous. Uh, it's, it's just part of our normal experiencing and behaving. Um, it's only when you have a kind of unusual expression of these things that we see, mm, actually, all of this is going on beyond the body as well as within the body. Uh, we don't see it beyond the body every minute, every day. It's fairly rare for most of us. Um, but there are times when we do see it. Uh, I'm getting information way beyond my sensory sphere. I'm having an effect in the world beyond anything I can actually touch and manipulate. And then we see that actually our prehending interaction with the world is going on beyond the body as well as within it. It's just that all of that's unconscious and it's usually not seen. The, the term you use, prehending, if, if I understand correctly, uh, originated with Alfred North Whitehead and uh, his, his, his theories. He was a, a great philosopher. I seem to recall in, in the J.B. Rhine's letters that Rhine attended one of his lectures, I think, at Harvard and referred to him as, as a very ponderous person, almost impossible to understand. So, <laughs> yes, he did say that, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, um, Ryan was a very smart guy, but he wasn't exactly a philosopher. Um, and I think he probably didn't have the patience for uh, for somebody like Whitehead. Um, yeah, I, I use that. I use Whitehead's term without all of the implications the, the way he defines the term, but I use it just because it. He pointed out that it's a way of grasping reality that includes both understanding and acting. The prehending means I take in, it also means I take hold of. And action, um, action, reception, experience, behavior, all these things are mixed together at this level. And Whitehead also pointed out that prehensions can be either conscious or unconscious. So I, it's, it's a very nice term for my purposes. So there's a real distinction there between prehending and comprehending. Yeah, because comprehending implies awareness. And I'm saying that ESP is by its very nature forever outside of awareness. Well, then how can we have ESP experiences? Well, I think we don't actually experience the ESP itself. We experience derivative phenomena that that issue from that and I, I could spell out what I mean by that and PK is the same thing if I if um, if I'm in an emergency situation of some sort and and um, say a very meaningful picture suddenly falls off the wall where it's been free very secure for years then um, it isn't that I've reached over and taken down the picture and put it on the floor I haven't carried out that behavior but we link the picture falling to my intentions and my experience because of what a meaningful coincidence it is. And in fact, that could be a PK event. Uh, that is, in, at this, I could be prehending that picture, which I'm doing all the time at some level, and uh, that picture falling at that moment could be expressing that fact. Well, it seems as if I might be jumping the gun a little bit on your theory, but it, it seems as if what you, what it implies is is something similar to the notion in physics of entanglement that everything is connected with everything else, and uh, at an unconscious level, of course, uh, 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 maybe people have rare moments of what's called conscious or cosmic consciousness, where you feel like you're aware of everything all at once, but most you. Humans simply cannot sustain that level of awareness. Maybe great psychics can do it briefly, uh, but but it seems as if that's uh, a potentiality within everyone. Yeah, I think so. I think it's an actuality within everyone at an unconscious level all the time. Um, I like I like to say that. Um, if ESP is so constant, where is it? Where is it hiding? And the answer to that is that it's hiding in every thought and every action. And does this connect to the idea of entanglement in physics? Well, maybe it, it does. I'm not a physicist, but luckily we have some very smart colleagues who, who are working hard on that, so I'm always following what they're doing with a lot of interest. And it may be that... Um, um, that they can make some real headway in that way. And, of course, that, that'll be wonderful. When I tell people I have a theory about parapsychology, what they always want to know is, oh, well, then you must be able to explain how the mind affects physical reality. You must be able to deal with the mind-body problem. And then I always have to say, no, I'm a psychologist. This is a psychological theory. Um, and I think it's more important than the physical question. And they say, well, yes, I, I feel sorry for you, but you can, you can explain why you believe that. Well, the reason I believe that is that um, almost all of our more robust findings in parapsychology are psychological in nature. That is, the, the psychology of the thing is essential. 
And if the purpose of science is to increase an understanding of part of nature, then let's go where the action has been. Let's go to the psychological science. And that's why it's a psychological theory. And I'm trying to develop ways to understand better what these things are, how they work, predict them, and ultimately make better use of them at a conscious level. And um, I think it's, it's the psychology of it that is going to allow us to have that kind of practical understanding. Uh, the physics of it is really interesting, and physicists especially find that um, very compelling. Um, how does the mind interact with the physical universe? You know, obviously that's a deep and important question. But I don't really deal with that question. Um, I'm, I'm interested in predicting, understanding and predicting when we're going to get expressions of ESP and PK, whether they're going to be positive or negative, that is in a hitting direction or in a missing direction, and how strong they're going to be. Those are the things I think a science of parapsychology should try to do, and that's why I've developed this theory to try to help us do that research to answer those questions. If I recall from what you said earlier, the paradigm experiment in psychology that is foundational to your theory would be the work in subliminal perception. I'll tell you a dream I had that actually led me to first sight theory. And in the, I think it's appropriate that it started with a dream, since in first sight theory I talk a lot about things like dreams. Um, in this dream, I'm in a stream, like you're in New Mexico. This is like a New Mexico mountain, Rocky Mountain stream. And I'm standing on a rock, and I jump to another rock. And then I'm looking around, and I figure out the next best rock to jump to, and I jump to that rock. And then the thought occurs to me, oh, this is what ESP is for. ESP is for getting to the next thought. And um, and I'm going to have to tell Richard about this, because Richard Broughton, who was a colleague at that time, had had a PA presidential address in which he said, what parapsychologists need to do if they want to understand psi is first figure out what it's for. And in the dream, I thought, okay, I'm waking up out of the dream at this point, and I'm thinking, this is what psi is for. It's for moving the mind to the next thought. Um, or in terms of PK, it's for moving our behavior to the next best behavior. And um, uh, I think it's, and all of that guiding, constructing process we see in subliminal perception. Um, a subliminal perception perception primes something. It doesn't give us an experience, but it primes certain classes of experience. And um, when you look at the research in subliminal perception and the research in parapsychology, they use different terms because they developed independently, but they're describing the very same patterns. Um, a, a subliminal prime functions exactly the way an ESP target functions in an ESP experiment. And I, I spell out the various similarities. And there's, um, I think what it shows is that all of our preconscious processes, which include long-term memory, uh, all of what we think of as creativity, they function with exactly the same patterns that the parapsychologists have been finding. And one thing I do in my theory is show that you can take parapsychological findings and map them onto research in memory or research in subliminal perception and or research in creativity. 
and you'll find exactly the same patterns apply. Likewise, you can take these much more developed areas of research, memory, creativity, uh, subliminal perception, carry those patterns over and apply them to parapsychology, and they work just wonderfully. Everything seems to be working kind of the same way at that unconscious level. This would be a good time to introduce a concrete example because it's rather abstract uh, what you've been saying so far. Well, a concrete example of, of a subliminal prime, um, I mean, I can talk about the way it's defined in experiments, but in real life, we... If presumably subliminal primes are happening all the time. They're flying around both of us right now as we sit and talk to screens. Um, but we're not aware of them because they're unconscious, they're subliminal. And in fact, since we're highly focused on what we're doing, I certainly am. I'm trying to make sense and look to you and talk to you and uh, deal with the technology and so forth, that I'm, I have a lot of focus. And so subliminal primes, when I'm, my mind is engaged in this kind of focus, are not actually going to be affecting my behavior very much. They're not going to be affecting my consciousness or my behavior very much. When I'm in a highly focused, concentrated state, I'm going to screen out almost everything else. And the same thing is true in parapsychology. When I'm really focused, really concentrating, um, the whole extraneous, much more of the world becomes extraneous to my purposes, and I make myself oblivious to it, and I don't in any way express it. In fact, if we tried to measure it while I'm focused like this, we would probably get a missing measure. We'd probably get a negative deviation. Uh, how, how do we see if subliminal perception is going on all the time? Do you ever see it in real life? Well, we almost don't. And then I realized actually there was one way that I did see it in my everyday life. And that is um, when I first became a little hard of hearing, and that was quite a while ago now, and before I got hearing aids, um, I would my level, my threshold for conscious awareness of sound was different than most people's. That it, someone would have to be louder for me to hear it than for the most of the people I'd be talking to. And sometimes I'd find myself in a circle of people and there'd be a conversation going on and I would something interesting would occur to me and I would say it. And then one time I did this and I looked around and my daughter was rolling her eyes as if to say, he's doing it again. And what I was doing again was without knowing it, I had reworded something that someone else in the conversation had said a few minutes before, but I hadn't consciously heard it. Everybody else had consciously heard it, and so they knew I was just repeating this earlier contribution. But for me, it was a brand new idea. For me, it had been a subliminal prime. For them, it was a conscious experience. For me, it was a subliminal prime. Um, and so I could catch myself in the act of expressing something that for me had been subliminal, and of course, for other people there, it wasn't. Because you were hard of hearing, it only came through at the subliminal uh, level. Subliminal means below the limit or level of conscious awareness. I think some of our viewers may not know much about the research on subliminal awareness. I, I remember back in the 1970s reading a book, I think by Norman Dixon, about the controversial science of subliminal perception. It, it reminds me, was it Richard Brown who wrote a book called Parapsychology, the Controversial Science? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And um, and that uh, those books of Dixon's were wonderful, and his research was was really groundbreaking. It's gone on. Um, that whole field has developed enormously, enormously since Dixon's day. But <clears throat> he made wonderful contributions in in developing that. I got to meet Dixon one time, and that was a a treat.
Now, you mentioned an experiment to test first sight theory would be different than a conventional parapsychology experiment. So, let, let, let's talk about that. What would such an experiment be? Well, first of all, uh, we would probably look almost exclude. We wouldn't ask people to guess what a target is, and we wouldn't ask people to um, try to make something happen. We would set up a situation in which we would look at what I call inadvertent behaviors of different kinds and make the unconscious material important to them in some way and then see while we're observing their behavior if we can see allusions um, to the material. And so, for example, um, one study I carried out for a number of years, uh, I had a there, there, there are a number of studies on subliminal perception research showing that um, subliminal stimuli can influence interpersonal behavior. So, for example, if you if you subliminally flash hostile material to people, angry, aggressive, bloody, so forth, to people, and then you put them in a situation in which there's a confederate who's behaving in an annoying way in the waiting room. Then you record your subjects and you see, you count the times that they express irritation or withdrawal, or in other words, if, the, if any way in which they express a, a, some kind of emotional response to the irritating confederate. And what we find is that if we expose people subliminally to hostile stuff before we put them in this waiting room, they're going to be much more responsive. They're going to get more irritable, they're more aggressive, more withdrawn, whatever their typical way of dealing with aggression is. If they've been subliminally exposed to happiness and flowers, they're going to be much less responsive to this um, irritating person. And there were other studies that um, showed some subjects material that had to do with cooperation and working together and achieving things as a group and so forth, and other people just had neutral uh, stimuli. And the people, who, and then we put them in groups, and we have ways to measure how readily cooperative they are with some group project. And we find that the people who've been pre-exposed to the cooperative stuff are friendlier, more cooperative, come up with ideas more quickly. They participate in a more positive way. The people who haven't had these exposures aren't quite so quick to do those things. And so what we see is that the subliminal stimuli have primed certain kinds of behaviors. <clears throat> so that was the analogy for this project. And I had a, a kind of quasi-therapy group of friends that met once a week for an hour, and we would have an unstructured hour of interaction. And these people, most of them were therapists, and so often the interaction was pretty emotional and lively, and usually it was a lot of fun. It was kind of spontaneous and fun. But in another town, we're in Chapel Hill, and in Durham at the Rhine Center or FRNM, a computer is selecting a picture. And we know that that picture is being selected. No one's looking at it. It's just selected as a number that identifies one of 400 pictures. And these pictures are, are arranged in sets of four. So it's going to pick one of a hundred envelopes and one of four pictures. And so now the session has ended. We've had our interaction, whatever we're going to do. We call up and we get the number of the envelope. So we pull the envelope and lay out the four pictures. Then we go through the four pictures and say, which of these pictures could have been a kind of symbol of the session we had today? That is, in terms of the content and the mood and the 
whatever about the picture. Just associate to these pictures, which is the most like our session, the next most, and then all the members rank them, and then those rankings are averaged. What we found was that the picture in Durham, we were able to unconsciously pick up that picture and express it in our behavior in the group, all unconsciously, to an extent that we could identify the picture, pick it out among the decoys to a highly statistically significant degree. So this is a study in which we see that nothing paranormal is obviously going on. We're just having a discussion among friends that gets fairly emotional and lively sometimes. And yet this, we also all have the intention in the back of our minds that we'd like to be expressing this target if, if we can, but we have no idea what the target is. We're just kind of open to that intention. And in fact, we do. We do enough that we can pick the right picture out much more than we should by chance. And there's some meaningful sub-relationships here, too. For example, we rated the qualities of these sessions. And, um, you know, I said that since my focus right now is is kind of clear and focused because I'm trying to make sense talking to you, um, I'm going to be screening out most of reality. My what I'm going to let in to forming my thoughts and my words is going to be a much narrower band than if I'm just sitting around daydreaming or if I'm playing or doing something creative, if I'm painting a painting. Um, well, these groups tended to be very playful, but sometimes they would get very serious and emotional. And when we rated the groups in terms of how intensely meaningful they were, how revealing people were, how emotional they were, we found that in the groups that were doing the hardest emotional work, the side disappeared. We weren't able to, we weren't expressing the pictures at those times. It, on the other hand, on the sessions that were very playful and light and not so serious and not so focused, we express the picture a lot, which makes sense in terms of my, in terms of my theory. Because uh, that's exactly how subliminal perception works. It's, it's actually how memory works. Um, so that's an example of a, of a study from a first sight point of view. Now, let me ask a few questions just to clarify the mechanics of the study. First of all, when, when a picture is exposed in a normal experiment on subliminal perception, it might be flashed on a screen for a hundredth of a second or something like that. Right. But in this case, since you're, the stimulus is of a parapsychological nature, uh, it's not flashed on a screen at all, not even for a th millionth of a second. So, so it's chosen uh, at random using, I, I presume, a random event generator. Is it chosen in advance of your session or afterwards? During. It's chosen right in the middle of the session uh, by, by a, a random process. And, the, and, and then the decoy pictures, you're presenting the group with four pictures. One of them is the actual target. Four, uh, three others are decoys out of a larger pool of, I think you said 400 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yes, there's zero sensory exposure. So it's a, it's a subliminal perception of zero intensity. It, all, all, it, all it is, is it's a meaning. It, it's an intention we have of getting what the computer is saying is going to be the right picture. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's, that's all there is, is just that intended meaning. And that orients us to the picture and the picture gets expressed. And at the end of the day, you're going to run this through the standard statistical evaluations that are used in uh, any behavioral science study. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. For example, one day um, uh, we were doing a gestalt therapy exercise and mm -hmm. one person was walking around the room and uh, somebody else says, do something now. And so he goes behind this bald headed guy and he rubs his head. Well, our target that day was a bull that was bald with a big circle on the, we're seeing the bull from above and the head's very prominent and there's a big circle on his head and an X in the middle, like target. <clears throat> uh, that, that was one kind of funny example. Another time the group was rather sad. Someone important to a couple of the members had died and the group was sad. And the correct picture that day was um, um, a house that had been devastated by a hurricane. Um, so the matches came in different ways, but they were congruent with our our experience in the group was that we were causing the pictures. We didn't experience ourselves as being influenced by the pictures. It felt more like we were causing the pictures. And so is it PK or ESP? Uh, it's, it was a pseudo-random generator. Uh, and so we might think that that makes PK less likely. But what the hell do we know? Well, I think we, for the benefit of our viewers, uh, let's explain what's the difference between a random event generator and a pseudo-random generator. Right. Well, a random, a truly random generator takes a truly random process like electrical static or like uh, radioactive decay, something that is innately unpredictable and random and samples it so that when you pick your sample, whatever number you get there is a truly random pick. It's not determined by anything that came before it and it has no relation to anything that's coming after it. A pseudo random generator is one where you've used a random process to generate a series of random numbers and they sit in a queue in a row. It's like looking up in a book of random numbers. They're all there. They're all in a row. They're random in the sense that there's no connection from one number to another. There's no internal dependency of the numbers, but they pre-exist. They're, they're laid out. And the, a pseudo-random gen generator in a computer is the same thing. It's a, it's a long line of invisible numbers where one pops up at a time. So f from a uh, parapsychological point of view, uh, a true random generator ought to be more susceptible to psychokinesis than a, a pre-existing list of random numbers. That's, that's what we would tend to assume, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, but again, um, um, unconscious primes are always experienced this way. I remember demonstrating hypnosis to students in a class and some very hyp hypnotizable student would volunteer and we would um, get an induction and I would say at a certain point, I'm gonna say a certain sequence of words and you'll get up and go to the back and raise the window. And so, okay, now you're awake and the class goes on. And then at some point I say that sequence of words, the guy gets up, he goes to the back and he opens the window. And I ask, why did you open the window? He'll give a perfectly good reason. He'll say, it was too warm in here, or it was too cold in here, or I wanted some fresh air. In other words, he'll rationalize his behavior in a way that seems true to him. As far as he knows, he chose to open the window when they darn well wanted to open it. But he's also responding to a hypnotic suggestion, which for him at that point is unconscious. So when we act on unconscious primes, we, we always feel like we're doing what we're choosing, and we are. It's just that part of our choosing is unconscious. 
It's very interesting. It reminds me of uh, a story I heard uh, once from Professor Jeffrey Kripal. He talked about life is like you're you're riding on an elephant, and the elephant is going to go wherever it goes, but you think you're in charge. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Now, I do think, though, it's worth emphasizing that Going back to my point that the unconscious is not just purely impersonal and mechanical, just because it's out of sight, it's also personal. That is, it obeys my intentions, my goals, my needs. So it's me doing things. It's just that a lot of my doing is unconscious. Well, Jim, it seems to me that we've scratched the surface of your theory, but it's very profound and very important because most of our viewers are not super psychics, uh, yet they're all interested in uh, this realm of experience. And what you're really getting to is how it's influencing us moment by moment throughout uh, our lives, every day, every hour, every, uh, you might say every second, uh, e even when we're asleep. So, uh, what I'm hopeful is that we can have a few more conversations to dig more deeply into uh, the implications of, of this theory and uh, also more deeply into the experiments that have been done to confirm it. Well, I would look forward to that. That'd be a lot of fun. I think it would be, and I think it would be of great value to our viewers. So, uh, for now, I want to thank you very much for being with me. Well, thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to see you. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.